Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Let's Delve. Today we're deviating from the norm to try something new and exciting. Not that random map generation isn't, but I thought it'd be fun to take a break from the project that we spent the last few episodes on. So today we're going to be building a prototype for a possible future game featuring a pretty cool art style. But before we can get into the project, let's talk about what makes this art style so cool. A couple of episodes ago, I introduced a program to the series I found called Magical Voxel. And one of you fine viewers pointed out in the comments that uh, this program actually has an interesting tie to Game Maker in particular. A couple articles later, I was down a rabbit hole that I was eager to try for myself. See, a lovely programmer created a program that actually works with Magical Voxel, allowing users to easily translate their 3D voxel models into a 2D sprite sheet. Why would anyone do this, you ask? Well, to create a pseudo 3D model, of course. Now, I could bore you with the technical details, but instead, let's make our own pseudo 3D models and see what type of game we can make with them. First things first, we needed some graphics. Now, usually graphics are last on my to-do list, but this was a special occasion. I opened up good old MS Paint and drew a very basic cat in a boat. I also did some traditional pixel art versions just to get an idea of how the character should look in general. Overkill? I know. The theme I went with was Cat Goes Fishing. A basic friend version was all I needed, so I imported that graphic into Magical Voxel and got to work. There's nothing fancy about the process, just a matter of placing voxels where they made sense, and eventually I carved out our protagonist. Unfortunately, the translation of my stylized cat left me with more of a dog than a cat, so I went with the dog. But, but maybe it's a dog-cat hybrid? I don't know, video games, man, they don't always have to make sense. But moving on, I did similar work with the fish. The idea with the 2D version was to start with an ideal final product, regardless of what point of view it started at. I was confident enough in my abilities, but it was a gamble in retrospect. Nonetheless, I had an idea at this point of what I wanted to do, so two versions of the fish were needed. A simplified swimming version, and the full-on model version. After the construction of the two fish models, I moved on to the box model that would follow the player. I wasn't sure how it'd come into play, but I modeled it anyway. Now that we had a few models to work with, it was time to start building the actual game. Well, quote unquote game. Using the same basic foundation box by Christmas was built on, the first thing I did was add a shockwave ability to the player's character. Aside from testing this pseudo 3D technique, another reason for this project was to test the limits of Game Maker's draw ability, at least to the best of my knowledge. So instead of relying on pre existing sprites to represent the shockwave, I went with drawing a circle, which represented the main shockwave ripple. Next, it was time for the fish. In terms of behavior, the fish are pretty simple. Move to direction, choose new direction, move to it, etc. However, should a fish get hit by the shockwave, they would get stunned. In this stunned state, it would allow the fish to be reeled in. And so I added a string component that would draw a line between the player and fish when clicked on. Assuming they're stunned, of course. Clicking again would reel the hooked fish in, and because gravity is still a thing, the fish would eventually fall back into the water if given enough time. Weirdly enough, this process took a lot longer than I anticipated, mostly because I made it more complicated than it needed to be in some places, but it wouldn't be me without unnecessary complications. But to make things simpler, I converted the fish code into a good old switch statement, and it all worked out eventually. So now that we've at least got a base to work with, it's time to add in our pseudo 3D models. After a bit of back and forth tinkering between editing the sprite sheets and importing them to Game Maker, I was eventually ready to begin what up to this point was merely a dream. Copying one article almost verbatim in terms of the implementation of this effect, it was finally time to see if all this hard work was going to pay off. Hitting test, I waited until boom. There it was. My 3D cat dog thing in a boat was in Game Maker. It rotated beautifully as I circled it with my mouse, watching it slowly math its way to give off the impression that it was a 3D model that we were seeing. It was amazing. A beautiful moment of understanding washed over me, seeing it work firsthand. However, my amazement was quickly stunted as I realized something wasn't right. I could see through the model. What was this? Did I mess up the art? Was the coding wrong? Did I once again math wrong? It bothered me, but I wasn't about to get hung up on any issues just yet. So I continued to import the other models. 
When in its swim state, the fish instance would use the shadow model, and when stunned, it would switch to the pseudo 3D model. And just to boast the 3D nature of the whole thing, I had the fish always focus its attention on the player, allowing for all sides of the model to be seen at will. After importing the fish model, I realized what went wrong with the player model. This is pseudo 3D. This isn't real 3D, and therefore we're not dealing with actual models, but the appearance of 3D models. This meant that translating the 3D model to 2D needed compensation for the space that technically doesn't exist. So going back into the 2D sprite, I added a darker tone to what used to be empty space. This would give the final effect the idea of depth slash shadowing that was originally lost. And voila, the problem was now fixed. Now, in reality, we could have stopped here. Uh, from a prototype perspective, we sought out to create something using this presentation technique and implement it into what was technically an interactive medium. But why stop there? Let's do a little improv and see what else we can do with this. In general, I was drawn to this effect for one reason. I love the cel shaded slash comic book art style of 3D. AAA Studios will always strive to make the most realistic looking games possible, but I personally think that stylized graphics such as the cel shaded style will always look best in the future. It's partly why I believe pixel art has continued to remain a popular art style, even in modern games. But I digress. I wanted to continue with this effect and create a border around what was important to help it stand out. My first attempt was to redraw a model below the initial model in black and resize it. The resulting effect was... Okay, but in the process of making the outline, I realized something. By interpolating the pixels, an option a lot of game maker developers never use because it often ruins the art assets, actually gave me something I didn't expect. Shadowing. For some reason, interpolating the pixels mixed with the pseudo 3D technique somehow left me with perfect shading in places that gave my model way more definition. I have no explanation as to how or why this worked, but it did. Anyway, after a while, I opted to instead use a completely different model that was simply two pixels larger as the outline for the models. This ended up working perfectly regardless if interpolation was enabled or not. I repeated the process for the fishes and changed the stage's color to blue you know, to make things more immersive. And speaking of immersive, I wanted to push what Taos could do as far as I could. Again, to the best of my knowledge, that is. So I auto-drew water tiles the entire width and height of the stage. Looking at the FPS tracker, it was obvious this hit the overall performance in a noticeable way. Nothing serious, but noticeable. This only got worse when I tried animating the tiles to look more like flowing water. Performance took a major hit and spawning more than a few fish actually started to affect the 60 FPS cap. So unfortunately, we'd have to deal with static water for now. At this point, I decided to use the box I'd been neglecting all this time, and much like the player model, it required a bit more tweaking to get things looking right. The box was an interesting character because it had a very specific position, and that was to always be behind the player. Easy, I thought. I know GameMaker has a built-in function that does a lot of the hard math, and it was as simple as implementing it properly. Adding the lengther function to the box should have done the trick, but for some reason the box would just not position itself properly. Was I wrong? Am I just that bad at math? I had to take a break, and no joke, read up on crazy amounts of mathematic formulas dealing with finding and executing proper relative positioning based on radius calculations that made me feel like an idiot. Goodwill hunting levels of calculations, folks. All of that research time would be for nothing, however, because I found out while tinkering with the sprites off video, all I had to do was alter the sprite origin to the proper offset, and the original length their code worked just as it should. One table flip later, I decided to add a few bits of detail to the presentation. First, I added a splash effect to when fishes emerge and plop into the water. Next, I drew even more circles. This would end up being shadows for the player, the box, and the airborne fish. I then added a splash effect to the player's boat, which happens randomly and only when the player is moving. And to sell the boat moving in the water even further, I added a ripple tail to the back of the player. Admittedly, uh, this might be detail overload. Continuing to add detail, I added a drop effect to the airborne fish which would not only make catching them a little harder, but also saw the idea of their falling. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the shadows to work properly and convey the whole falling effect, but it's likely not too difficult to fix in the future. I hope. I also made the crosshair slightly larger to compensate for the fish falling. At this point, I was almost ready to call it. We had a base quote-unquote game, at the very least an interactive medium, and it looked pretty dang cool. 
However, I had a last bit of inspiration to make it an actual game with consequences. Now, up until this point, the idea of the game was to blast a fish out of the water, hook them, and reel them in. But what if there was a fish you didn't want to catch? What if some fish were cursed? For the sake of time, I simply recolored the current fish model red and gave the fish instance a chance of being cursed. It started as a 50-50% chance, but I eventually settled on a 10% chance. So theoretically, if this were an actual game, catching the cursed fish would be bad, which meant players couldn't just go crazy and try to hook every fish blown out of the water. Then I realized, well, what if you accidentally hook a cursed fish? Should you just be able to let it go? Well, sure. Or, you know, you could blast it to bits instead. <laughs> so I added the ability for players to fire bullets from the boat. Also, I added a bit of screen shake to the shockwave and bullet firing. Because Vlambeer. And to make it clear that players are shooting the fish, when hit, the airborne fish would pop and their guts would go flying. Uh, okay, the bursts of red guts was a little much but that would be fixed. Instead of unnecessary amounts of gore, I took a page from one of my favorite voxel-style games, 3D.Game Heroes, and changed the color of the guts to reflect the colors of the fish's skin. And in case it becomes a mechanic, I had the cursed guts get sucked into the player's box. Now there was only one little detail left to add. Make a better shockwave. Sticking with using strictly circles, I added a couple more circles, which grew at different rates. I then added a transparent circle under the main shockwave line to give it a similar quote-unquote disturbance effect that the boat trail gave. The end results are pretty good for using nothing more than basic shapes and uh, a shift in sizes. In general, I was actually really happy with how this project turned out, and it quickly evolved into something more than just a practice slash prototype. While the gameplay isn't deep, I feel like it'd make for a good casual pickup and play on a bus or airplane or something. In fact, I went into this project with the intent on calling this episode a one-shot, but, and maybe I'm alone in this opinion, I think this project might deserve more time and effort, possibly developing it into an actual game with actual conditions. Regardless of my opinion and how happy I am with the end results, I have to say that I agree with other developers who say the pseudo 3D technique is in no way efficient. While the end product is impressive, you're better off working with an actual 3D engine or some other form of 3D. This technique is time consuming, tedious, leaves very little room for dynamic behavior, and is overall likely a much larger strain on the system slash engine than going with something simpler, like basic 2D art. Having said that though, I don't regret trying this out and encourage others to at least try it for themselves. It's fun, it's cool to see firsthand, and should this ever become easier to do, could mean great things for future game makers slash 2DS slash pseudo 3D projects. There's a bit on this technique that can be found online. I would highly recommend checking out Mopin, aka the creator of Downwell's take on this technique. Uh, it's fascinating what untapped potential may lie hidden in Game Maker's engine, and what it could mean for the engine's future and the developers who can make the most of it. But for now, that's where our lovely adventure into pseudo 3D shenanigans ends. Again, I'm proud of what was accomplished here, though it's nothing groundbreaking. I'm excited to see what you guys thought of it, so be sure to leave them in the comment section below. And as always, if you have suggestions on how to improve this series as a viewing experience, I take all suggestions into consideration. Also, be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed the series and want to see more, especially if you enjoyed the change of pace. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Okay, good. Seems to be working exactly as it should. That's good. That's a good sign. <laughs> that means we're starting off strong. All right. Now we're going to be working on the floor. The actual floor.